There's that John Capobres is back. Look at there. Hi, John. Glad to have you. Welcome home for the holidays. Thank you, everyone, for coming to uh, be part of our class this morning. And as we uh, get ready for uh, Santa Claus this week, hopefully all of you got your shopping done. And uh, if not, you can join the mad rush that's out there that's no doubt still trying to get it all done. So we appreciate you being here. If you're visiting, thanks so much for coming and being part of our group this morning. We're uh, going uh, slowly through the book of Acts, and uh, we need to go a little faster, but uh, we'll work on that next quarter, I hope. So, so at this point, uh, we'll just uh, keep on trucking on. Last week, we were chapter, the end of chapter 2 and um, the start of chapter 3, and so I want to do a quick review, just some of the real uh, the highlights of uh, what we learned. So one of the things that we learned was that what we need to do when we come to the full knowledge of Christ, we learned uh, what we should be doing, and that was... I'm not telling you, you'll have to know. We needed to repent and be, exactly, we needed to obey the gospel so that we could have remission of our sins. And that's what the early Christians, that was their questions, what should we do? And that was Peter's response. Uh, next, we learned that God's promise was for everyone, both uh, Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, the Jews at that particular time didn't understand that. Uh, but uh, they will as uh, we continue through the book of Acts and uh, seeing how God's plan plays itself out. We also learned that uh, those who received the word were baptized or immersed uh, and were added to the church according to the scriptures. We also learned that those uh, early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship uh, to the breaking of bread or taking of the Lord's Supper, uh, and to uh, prayer. Uh, they had all, all things in common uh, and were helping those who were in need by uh, selling their possessions and belongings when necessary and appropriate. And uh, literally what I said was they were just a bunch of happy, happy campers, uh, happy Christians uh, at that point in time uh, as they began their Christian walk uh, and uh, established the church there in Jerusalem. And that ended uh, chapter 2, and then we moved into chapter 3, and as we uh, began chapter 3, we uh, saw immediately uh, this lame man uh, who was taken to the steps. He was always carried to the steps of the temple uh, every day and was asking for alms, uh, to uh, aid him in his uh, life, in his living, if you will. And um, that is, the, the chapter starts off with Peter and John going to the temple. And uh, the man saw them, and, and as he did with everybody that came to the temple, asked for alms from them. And, of course, their answer was, we don't have any money, but what we do have, we'll give you. So look at us. And uh, we'll uh, allow you to, or we'll give to you what we have. Um, and so Peter told him that by the power of Jesus that uh, to rise up and walk. And that's exactly what happened. And he was healed at that point in time, a miracle in front of all the people. Uh, and of course, all the people knew this guy because remember we looked uh, and found in, uh, further on in Acts, it tells us that he was 40 years old and had been crippled from birth, so he'd been living there uh, for all of those, or been going to the temple all of those years, and so he was well known amongst the people, and the people could see that uh, indeed he was healed miraculously. And, and uh, so that brings us up to about verse 12, and that's about where we left off uh, for uh, last week. And uh, we mentioned a little bit about verse 12, so a little rep repetition won't hurt us. So we'll start there. But before we start there, uh, Shelby has agreed to offer a prayer for our class. So, Shelby. Our Father in heaven, we're just uh, 
praise you, Father, because you fill our hearts with joy. Your promises to us, Father, are just uh, so uh, absolutely awesome and incredible. Father, thank you for loving us like you have. Father, we praise you for your creation, the wonders of the world that you've created. Everywhere we look, your handiwork is there, Father, before us. The beauty of this wonderful planet is just so wonderful, Father. Thank you. You've um, created a place for us to live in and to enjoy and to experience and to praise you for the handiwork that you've provided for us to see. And, Father, we know this is just a sample of what's to come. Father, your blessings in our lives are so wonderful. You fill our lives with blessings everywhere we look, every direction we go, Father. You stack us up with your blessings uh, far beyond our heads, Father. Thank you. Your kindness towards us is so great. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Bless us every day. Help us to walk and to be faithful to you. Build our faith. Help us to be acceptable in your sight, Father. Just bless us and keep us in your care. Father, this uh, is a wonderful day you've given us to uh, wake up to and to be able to come to worship with our church family, Father. Blessings upon us as we do that. We pray that our worship to you is acceptable. Father, your special blessings on all the men that lead us and uh, direct our thoughts in our worship service today. We especially pray for Dave as he directs our class that uh, he will be blessed and that um, we will be blessed by your word that it may touch us. And for Richard as he brings the lesson, Father, your blessings upon him. And Lori, Father, what a wonderful blessings they are to this congregation and all that they do for us. And just keep us in your care and in your watch, Father. Thank you for this time of worship, this time of study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelby. Okay, so as we begin today, um, looking uh, starting from verse 12, chapter 3, um, one of the things that uh, is happening, and, and, and we remember this from last week, there's a lot of, of praising God going on because of this miracle. And... Um, the rulers at that time are, are taking note of that uh, praise that's going on and that celebration, and uh, they become concerned over that because they're fearful that um, whatever is being said um, is going to pull away from their authority uh, and pull away from their um, standing within the the Jewish council, if you would. So, that's where we pick up. So, the people responded as though the, through the power of the healing was in John, Peter and John, and we spoke about that. Um, some of your versions might use for the word uh, piety from the New American Standard, uh, use uh, the word holiness or godliness. Uh, so, you might see that in your versions. That is uh, acceptable. Uh, those are okay um, translations of that word that's there. So um, don't be concerned when you read a different version than the New American Standard and it says something other than piety, uh, holiness, or godly, or yeah, godliness is uh, clearly acceptable. So Peter, Peter recognized the opportunity then uh, from seeing that these people were were confused a bit uh, and thinking that it was Peter and John that was had all of the power and uh, they, they um, obviously were not looking at this properly and so Peter took the opportunity to preach and so that's what we're going to see uh, from verses um, 13 and uh, a couple verses more 13 through 15. So Peter wasted no time, first off, just as he did before in his very first sermon of condemning them uh, for their part in uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and uh, he again took them back to the Old Testament that they would have been very familiar with uh, and, um, and basically told them that they were, they were wrong for doing that and, and explained why they were. The blame for killing Jesus I think, was placed squarely on their shoulders. Um, and uh, he basically said that, in essence, they pressured the Romans to carry out what the Jews wouldn't do, uh, but the Jews did had that happen, and so the Romans carried out the crucifixion. In verse uh, 16, it talks about um, 
the faith and, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus uh, who strengthens this man. So my question is, whose faith is this talking about? Whose faith is this talking about? And that is the question. That is the question for the audience. Whose faith? As you read that verse, whose faith? Mike. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, Mike says uh, he believes that it's the apostles' faith. Uh, some might believe that it was the faith of, of the lame man. Some might believe that it's the faith of all of the people that are there. But I think, uh, as Mike does, um, that, that it is the apostles' faith, uh, Peter and John's faith, uh, that has caused this uh, lame man to be um, healed. In regards to the lame man having the faith, uh, it doesn't seem to me to fit uh, because first off, the lame man didn't know anything about Jesus because he hadn't heard anything preached about Jesus before he was healed. He just saw Peter and John wandering up just as many other people um, came uh, to the temple and simply ask for alms, ask for money, uh, asks for help in that regard. And so there had been no preaching for his hearing, at least none that we know of from the scripture. So in my view, he had no basis for that faith. And then we'll remember uh, Romans uh, 10, 17 tells us what the basis of faith is. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so he hadn't had any of that yet, and so for me, I think that, that it would seem uh, um, not correct for us to think that the faith belonged to him or even the people around him. I think the faith had to be with Peter and John. And so, that's my idea of the faith. The next verses, 17 and 18, uh, Peter plainly, uh, his uh, denunciation uh, or plain denunciation of their conduct uh, was tempered by an acknowledgement uh, that their wicked actions had not been an act of deliberate rebellion against God. Uh, and I think that's kind of what this uh, verse is really telling us. Rather, um, they acted out of ignorance. Now, if I am unaware of a law, does that make me guilty or not? I'm unaware of a law, am I guilty of that law or not? And so, yes. And so, so even though maybe they were ignorant of this fact, they were indeed guilty. And that's, I think, Peter's message. If um, just because I didn't see the stop sign and I ran through it doesn't make me not guilty because I didn't see it. Just because I drive 70 in a 35 mile an hour zone because I didn't see the speed limit sign doesn't make me uh, not guilty of that. I'm clearly guilty. And I think that's the case as here. Larry. Yeah, Larry, Larry brings up uh, Jesus' uh, time on the cross and, and some of the words that Jesus uh, presented on the cross, which uh, he asked the Father to uh, forgive them because they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, and uh, if we believe that uh, uh, Jesus is telling the truth, and I think all of us here would do that, uh, then we would uh, obviously honor this very idea that that Peter is offering to them that uh, even though they didn't know what they were doing, they're still guilty. So, 19 talks about uh, Peter not um, is now speaking, I think, the same conditions of salvation which he said on Pentecost. And, and of course, that is repent, uh, got to determine to quit sinning, need to turn to God, uh, or return, uh, as the New American Standard. Again, some of your versions, King James specifically and, and New King James, will use the term be converted. So therefore, repent and be converted. Um, most of the 
Brotherhood commentators take exception to the uh, translation that the King James uses in this particular case because of the Greek word that's behind this. And now I'm off into only being able to repeat what I read because I have no knowledge of the Greek. But what they say is that the Greek word um, that is used here for return is is an active word. And when, you, when the New King James or the King James uses be converted, that's passive. And so they take exception to that translation the way that is because of, of the active verb as opposed to a passive verb. You can take that for what you want, um, but I think that the idea behind that uh, is certainly valid. They needed to turn to God. So they needed to repent and turn back to God because they clearly weren't there. Um, forgiveness uh, is having their sins uh, wiped or blotted uh, out. And then the times of refreshing uh, most logically, I think, corresponds to the gift of the Holy Spirit. The refreshing of the soul comes through the joy of salvation and all its attendant blessings which are promised by the Holy Spirit. And so I think that 319 is a verse that really repeats what Peter said in Acts 238 in just a different form, a different way. It's not as clear or succinct, but I think it gets to the same point. Um, and so that's my idea. Next. 20 and 21, uh, Jesus is going to remain in heaven uh, in the times of uh, restitution or uh, restoration of all things, uh, and he must reign until all his enemies are uh, going to be put under his feet. And we find that uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and following. When the final resurrection takes place, death will be conquered, uh, creation of God will be restored uh, to its planned perfection. And uh, we see that in 2 Peter and also in Revelation. So I think that's what that, those verses are, are talking about. In this verse, or these verses, 22 through 24, uh, this is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 through 19. Christ is a prophet uh, like unto Moses. Uh, both serve as lawgivers and as a deliverer from bondage. Um, Peter tells uh, his audience, uh, the Jews who were loyal to Moses, that now they must heed Christ, heed to Christ as a prophet of God. Uh, in fact, uh, if they reject him, this verse says they'll be lost. And so Peter was speaking directly to the Jews who knew the old covenant well, and uh, would understand this verbiage that comes from Deuteronomy, and understand how that, how now Christ is similar to, like unto, as the scripture says, unto um, Moses. So, as we think about all of those prophecies, um, there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that describe Christ in some form or fashion, perhaps about his birth, perhaps about his life, perhaps about his death or his burial or his resurrection or his glorification. So if I'm a Jew and I know the Old Testament well, it would seem to me that with so much inspired verifications, it's outstanding, or I don't understand how they wouldn't see what's happened here and understand that Jesus was clearly um, the Savior of the world. And, and Peter speaks about this again uh, in, um, in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. Uh, this is, I seem to have left my phone. See, you're supposed to pay attention to the screen and silence your phones. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's speaking about the things that he's talking about here in Acts. But we were, and also earlier on as Jesus walked with them on the earth, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such uh, an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic uh, glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven, and we were with him on that holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so here Peter, in, in his book, uh, second, the second book that... Uh, Peter wrote, uh, or letter, I should say, is confirming these things that he's talking about uh, in Acts. And uh, I think that that is supportive of the idea about using all of these prophecies that were spoken of in the Old Testament, confirm the things about Jesus uh, in the New Testament. So in verse uh, 25 and 26, the Jews were... As this says, the sons of the prophets and were members of the covenant. Uh, now, this is not in the sense of a, a lineage uh, per se. Uh, they may, uh, may not have all been in a lineal descendant of a prophet, but because of the way that God treated the Jews as his own people, they were descendants of and heirs to all of that promise. Uh, and, and promises and predictions and blessings of the covenant. And, um, and so Peter uses this verse to reinforce that, um, th that the promise uh, to in Abraham included all of the families of the earth. Uh, and of course, at this point, this would also include, when, with this language, the Gentiles, even though the Jews, again, aren't recognizing that because they're they're focused, they have this stovepipe focus on themselves and that they believe that only themselves are the chosen people. But that's going to become evident as we continue our study through Acts. So all of the peoples of the earth, um, including um, the Gentiles, and, and as in this verse, Peter's hearers were Jews, this application, uh, of course, is made to them. So the conclusion of the whole matter uh, is that salvation will come through uh, them, um, come to them through faith uh, in Jesus, and they're turning away from sin, and that's Peter's, uh, Peter's message. And that concludes chapter 3. What questions there might be? Yes, no one. Yes, uh, Nolan brings forth the, uh, the idea from Acts chapter 17, verse 30, uh, where it says that uh, in, in past times, God overlooked uh, things of, of uh, um, ignorance, but now he uh, does not do that, uh, that everybody is held accountable for all of the things that God has presented. Did I get that quite right, Nolan? Is that about? Okay. So, All right. Other questions? About chapter 3. All right, so that gets us to chapter 4. And now the persecution is going to begin. Persecution. Peter and John had, had healed a man. As we remember, Peter and John had healed a man, a lame man, on the steps of the temple. Uh, and pro Peter then had proclaimed uh, that they had performed this miracle by the power of Jesus. Uh, the one the Jews and his audience had killed. Further, he bore testimony to the fact that God had raised Jesus from the dead. The Jewish leadership, of course, especially the Sadducees, um, were very disturbed by this preaching. And um, they didn't, the Sadducees, of course, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So consequently, Peter and John were arrested and uh, tried before the Sanhedrin, which is the high court of the Jews. And that's what we're going to see. 
So in, in um, the first verse, um, these Jewish leaders uh, interrupted the preaching of Peter and John. Um, and so they, they mounted the very first opposition to the gospel. So this is the first time anybody has challenged the gospel. And that uh, was done so by the Jewish leaders. And we're going to see, as we move through Acts, the conflict that we have between the Jews and the Christians. And uh, that's going to become greater and greater and greater to the point where that conflict is almost greater than the conflict with the Romans. Uh, but we'll, that's for another day, but uh, that's for, for the future what we're going to see. So... Uh, this verse talks about the captain uh, of the temple. Um, the captain of the temple was the priest that was charged with the police force, the temple police force, consisting of uh, the Levites. And they had the responsibility of preserving uh, order on the temple grounds. The Sadducees uh, were a politically powerful Jewish sect who denied that their uh, was any resurrection of the dead. They also denied the existence of angels and of spirits, and we see that in Acts 23, verse 8. So, <clears throat> being greatly disturbed, some uh, versions will, will use the word uh, grieved or annoyed. The Greek word which uh, for disturbed here means uh, trouble, displeased, offended, pained, um, and so it's all of those types of words. Uh, New American Standard chose to use the word disturbed. Some of your versions may use something else, but you get the idea that it uh, was not um, from the Jewish leader's standpoint. Uh, these guys were not good guys. These guys were, were um, bringing... Uh, a contrary thought process to the Jews uh, and taking away or attempting to take away some of the authority perhaps of this Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin. So the preaching of the resurrection of Christ grieved them because it directly contradicted their doctrinal beliefs. Uh, it also proved that they had wicked hands in murdering um, the Son of God. So they participated in uh, that crucifixion. Rather than considering the fact that they were in error and needed to repent, they reacted like a lot of people that are guilty of things or prejudice perhaps uh, do when the truth exposes them. They retaliate with anger and uh, with uh, deflection and uh, saying, well, we didn't really do that. Uh, wasn't, we didn't do any of that kind of stuff. And that's kind of how um, these Jews, they reacted with anger and retaliation um, against Peter and John. So the opposition uh, of these uh, men could not prevent, though, the power of the gospel from uh, having its effect. The people heard the message the people, some of the people at least, responded to that message and accepted that message. So even though the Sanhedrin was uh, angry about what Peter and John were preaching, uh, their message still got through. Um, the, the preachers in, in this verse um, had been uh, bound, they'd been thrown into prison, but the word was not. So the word was out there, and we see that again in uh, 2 Timothy 2.9, for which I suffer hardship, this is Paul speaking, even to imprisonment as criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. And, and uh, that holds true here in Acts as it did back there uh, when he was talking to Timothy. So what about this number 5,000? Uh, what about that number 5,000? Is that 5,000 additional men, or is that 2,000 additional men added to the 3,000 that happened on the day of Pentecost, so now they came to 5,000? So what is, the, what is the thought process of the audience with regards to this number? Okay, well, I guess you'll just have to follow along with me. Um, 
Here's what one commentator said, and I think this will help us to see what this actually means. Luke's probable meaning, therefore, is that there were 5,000 men besides women and children who believed. The question arises whether the 5,000 mentioned in this were the total number of men who had become believers since Pentecost, or whether 5,000 men became believers on this occasion as a result of the preaching of Peter and John. Most commentators believe that the total number of men who had become believers since Pentecost had come to be about 5,000. It is natural to understand this to mean that with the new converts on this occasion, the total number of believers in Jerusalem came to be about 5,000. So what we have here is an addition of 2,000, or at least that's what, again, most commentators uh, agree upon. So that brings the total now to 5,000 men, in addition to the women and whatever children they, they might have uh, had as well. Questions about that? Yeah, see, we don't have a, a number for that, and that's, that's a valid question. Um, we don't know, uh, at, at least from Scripture, we don't know what that number is. But clearly that Scripture tells us that there were others being added every day, and so that number certainly could have been increasing. Yeah, good. Yes? Yes, yeah, the question is, um, with regard to the population, is we're just talking about this local area, or was it more widespread? At this point in time, we're only talking about Jerusalem. So this is only in Jerusalem, because we haven't expanded out beyond Jerusalem yet. The, the apostles haven't gone outside of Jerusalem at this point. They will soon, uh, but not at this point. Right. Bill says that uh, based upon, um, we know as we, as we go through Acts, that we see, uh, or, or even go back into the Gospels, that we see when Jesus gathered um, people around, there were oftentimes four or 5,000 people at a time. And so it would not be uh, impossible to think that perhaps this, would, um, this could include uh, the whole 5,000 from this very, uh, very... Uh, thought process or, or uh, at this location. So, is that about right? Yeah, Mark? Yeah, Art's saying that. That's where the commentators. Yeah. Yeah, the Art is saying that the as we look at those two um, different passages in in, in Acts, uh, the chapter two, it says that they were they were added to the church uh, that many souls, and in this in this uh, section, it says that they came to be two different. Uh, ideas, and so based upon that, he can see how the commentators arrive at maybe just uh, a, a total number being at 5,000, but he also sees Bill's point that it certainly could be more than that. All right, so let's move on. So verses uh, 5 and 6, this verse uh, names the three groups that made up the Sanhedrin, um, and of course, this was the highest court of the Jews. So I wanted to take a look. The first, uh, first group are the rulers, and I think that the rulers most likely would be the chief priests. Uh, the next group are the elders, which would be men of age uh, and influence who were selected to sit on the council. And the last group are the scribes, 
uh, and the scribes were professional students and teachers of scripture. Uh, so these are the guys that are, that are most knowledgeable, typically, of the law. Um, and then it adds a couple of other guys, uh, person, people, John and Alexander. We don't know anything about these guys. Um, this is the only time that they were even mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and to know um, who they were, we don't know. But you have to anticipate that because they were there and sitting with the council, that they had to be highly respected men um, and uh, certainly well-known, I suspect, uh, as well. But that's about all we know about John and Alexander here. So, 7 and 8, uh, Peter and John were placed in the center uh, before the council in a, in a position, no doubt, that would have uh, been a bit intimidating. And uh, most of the commentators talk about this, this sitting council. Uh, they typically did it like in a semicircle type thing where the people they're talking to are kind of surrounded by them, except there's maybe a, the backsides open but they're on all sides except for the back side. Uh, and that's kind of the, the idea behind how that they were placed um, before uh, this, this council. One of the things that we see is that there were no formal charges uh, made at this time, uh, but the Sanhedrin wanted to know by what authority uh, or by whose power they were using in order to uh, perform this miracle. And, and Peter was able to respond boldly um, by uh, the inspiration, of course, of the Holy Spirit, uh, just as Jesus had promised that uh, this, this kind of activity would happen back in Matthew 10. And when we look at Matthew 10, uh, we see that, um, but be aware of men, for they will, and of course this is Jesus speaking to his apostles, be aware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of the Father who speaks for you. And so Jesus knew that this was going to happen. And obviously he predicted this. And uh, he attempted to share that with his apostles to give them the courage. And, of course, uh, a lot of the things that happened uh, in those first uh, uh, Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, did not um, necessarily, did the apostles truly understand. But here we have, I'm guessing, probably in their memory, would now pop up because of the Holy Spirit, uh, and they would now understand what Jesus had told them because what Jesus had told them had now come to pass as they were standing before these rulers and they were being uh, uh, chastised at least for uh, doing what they did. So Peter was fully aware that he was addressing the most powerful leaders among the Jews, but according to this scripture, he showed no signs of having any intimidation or being uh, fearful of, of anything. Verse 9, um, the answer is uh, simple and to the point. Um, that a good deed had been done was obvious. Everybody understood that this miracle had taken place and that this lame man was now able to walk, able to stand, able to, as we read earlier, jump around. So he had lots of uh, abilities now that he never had before. So... Why should they be thrown in jail for a good deed? That was Peter's uh, question back to the Sanhedrin. Um, and, and so as we think about that, we, see, we, we, we put in our mind, Peter and John were on trial for healing a cripple. So that's what the trial's all about, for healing this cripple. So, next verse. Peter, uh, without, without soft peddling of the truth, Peter affirmed in a direct manner that this man had been made whole by the power of Jesus Christ, the same one that had crucified um, and that God had been, and that God had raised, <coughs> excuse me, from the dead. 
We also learn from this verse that in addition to Peter and John, the lame man was present, standing as irrefutable, living confirmation of Peter's words. So the Sanhedrin had no choice but to accept what had happened uh, and understand that what had happened was, in fact, indeed a miracle. Um, and so Peter brings them back with this next verse, back to the Old Testament again, um, in uh, Psalm uh, 118.22, where it says that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. In rejecting Jesus... Uh, these Jewish leaders had made, in my view, a colossal blunder because um, this was right in front of them. They knew what the old law had to say. They knew this scripture was in the old law, and yet by rejecting Christ, they had uh, rejected the cornerstone of God's spiritual building. So the rulers of the people had refused to build on the foundation stone sent by God, that being, of course, Jesus. And by this rejection, uh, they stood uh, condemned. In 12, we read our, um, whoops, hello. 12 uh, talks about uh, Jesus uh, had given the lame man, a kind of physical salvation, but Peter is here speaking of a far greater salvation, isn't he? Uh, Jesus came to the world uh, so that he could provide spiritual salvation, salvation uh, from the guilt and punishment of sin. And um, Peter also makes the point that Jesus is the only one through whom this salvation can come a claim Jesus made shortly before his death. So we remember in John, and a very familiar verse to us uh, should come immediately to your thought process. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so um, salvation can't come from any other source. Uh, nowhere in the world is there anyone besides Jesus who can save us. And if we are saved, he's the one by whom we must be saved. So no matter how much sympathy, and this is Dave Rich commentary, no matter how much sympathy we might have for other religions that don't accept Jesus as their Savior, and how good of people that they are and how good of life they might live, based upon this scripture, uh, there is, in my view, there's no hope for those people without Jesus. And so, um, as long as, as they continue to reject Jesus and, and uh, lift up someone else in, in that place to honor and to to uh, bow down to, if you will, um, they have no hope, um, at least I don't think so, from this verse. 13, um, the, bottom, the boldness of these apostles was a result of their deep convic conviction. They spoke confidently uh, about what they knew to be true. Um, the ru rulers marveled because they viewed both men to be without a professional training. Now remember... Here we go again with all of this hierarchy in uh, the, the Jewish folks, the, the, the high Jewish folks. And uh, if you hadn't been trained in such and such a class or under such and such as tutelage, uh, you were nothing. And of course, these guys are from Galilee, and Galileans, in their view, were stupid. Uh, they didn't have any, uh, any kind of training, and so these guys couldn't possibly know anything. That was the Jewish hierarchy opinion. And of course, we know differently now. Of course, we have all of the, the words. But um, they did at least marvel that um, they uh, viewed both men to be without because they had no training. Um, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus in the final thing. Okay, next time we'll start with uh, 14 and continue to work our way forward. Thank you again all for... Uh, comments and um
thoughts. Appreciate that very much.